Stanton, you should have control of the uh, of the webinar now. And Nancy, I'm going to mute you. And Stanton, you should be able to speak now. Can we? Can you give it a t test here, Stanton? Yeah. All right. And yes, you should I have. Have, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. You excellent. should have control of the uh, the PowerPoint now. You can share your screen. All right. Excellent. Okay, I get the lunchtime crew. This is great. I hope everybody has a bottle of, of uh, Merlot they can open up and pour themselves a nice glass of wine and enjoy the next uh, half hour here. So we're going to talk about biological control in the greenhouse uh, with uh, herbs. Stan, you, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you have not shared your screen yet. Oh, is it up now? Um, not yet, no. Hmm. Must be missing something. Uh, it's showing up here. Let me uh, pull this back away from you, and we'll try again. Okay. So you should get a. Um, it says Brian. It says uh, uh, Brian took over as May presenter. You are no longer the presenter. Okay, I'm going to give you the give you the presenter again in just a moment. There should be. A, Asked you if you want to share your screen. Yeah, and I uh, click on show my screen. Are we up this time? No, we're good. Yep. Okay. All right. Excellent. Okay. I'm with the University of Maryland, and uh, it has my email on there if anybody needs to get a hold of me afterwards. And uh, we do have a website. I didn't put the website up there, but if you send it along, I'll be happy to share information with you. And we're going to talk about the biological control in herbs uh, for the afternoon session here. What you want to do is, if you're going to herbs, is uh, make a, a list of which herbs you have that you grow, and as you get experience with those, you're going to notice which ones are the real problem childs, uh, which ones have the insects, mites, disease, and that sort of thing. So you can concentrate your monitoring on those key herbs, because a lot of the herbs just don't really have that many problems. Uh, one of the, the problems I would start out with is spider mites. And the, some of the herbs that we've listed over the years in dealing with growers here in Maryland that have problems with this are the mints, sage, lemongrass, lemon balm, hyssop, or hyssop, and winter savory. Now, what happens is at this time of year, many of the herb growers are uh, taking cuttings, starting rooted plants, and shipping them off into the market. And when you turn on your heat system in your greenhouse, your humidity lowers. So with that lower humidity, you'll see the spider mite populations usually shoot up on you. Um, we had some earlier speakers talking about the different types of mites. Usually on herbs, we usually see two spotted spider mites as the problem. And uh, in a greenhouse, they really don't go through any diapause stage like they would outside. Uh, and they can stay active just about all the time. But we usually see most of that activity in that uh, the winter months as the heat system's on there. Next time we'll see them as the summer. If you have spider mites on there, uh, Nancy did a nice job of explaining earlier about spider mites, and there's a picture in the lower part of your screen showing an adult. Um, when they're feeding, they use their chelicery to jam into the plant cells and wound those cells, and they sop up the juice. So you get that stippling effect. And you've got two different plants here showing the um, stippling on the top of the foliage. Usually you're going to find the mite on the underside. So when you're monitoring for this, you want to take your paper, slide it underneath, bang it over top of that, and then look on your paper with your hand lens to uh, pick up the uh, spider mite and actually see it. As far as the biological control goes for two-spotted spider mite, we've been working with uh, Maryland herb growers for several years that are producing plants to usually it's to ship to other uh, to garden centers and also to go to other states. And things we've been most successful with is when they have a spider mite population building up on the plants, we usually go in with the predaceous mite Phytosolus persimilis, and we've recommended somewhere between five to six of these mites per square foot. Um, earlier, Suzanne was talking about suppliers on these uh, biologicals, and one of the uh, least expensive usually is these um, persimilis to, to purchase. They're very aggressive. They go after the, um, the the young stages, nipple stages of this insect or mite, 
and uh, the adults. They really don't do a good job of feeding on the eggs, and when after they feed on things, they usually move out of the area. So we combine that usually with another predaceous mite called Amblyseus californicus. That mite will just kind of hang around on some plants. If you got something with pollen around there, they'll feed on that. They're more laid back, uh, and they'll hang around. So when you do that combination, you get that aggressive action out of the persimilis when they're knocking your mites down. And these uh, little californicus will hang out, and they'll feed on the young nymphs, and maybe a few eggs and that sort of thing, and keep it suppressed. And we usually do that, again, around five to six of these per square foot. And so um, and that works very nicely, of course. If uh, spider mites uh, got out of control and the biological control was not uh, doing it for you, um, a couple of materials we've used in the past as a Duractin, uh, Suzanne mentioned for years we thought that it didn't have any impact on uh, any beneficials, but we're finding now as a Duractin has some impact on some of these predaceous mites. So if you're using those, maybe not choose that one. But if you're not using them and you just want to use a low risk material that is labeled on herbs, you've got several brand names there Azotin, Ecomen. Uh, Nemex, uh, Ornizen, Nemazon. Horticultural oil I've been working with the longest. And I've been working on that since the 1990s. Uh, pure spray oil, uh, suffix oil, very effective on the herbs. And that can knock mite populations down. Uh, so if it got out of control, your biological control wasn't working for you, you can go in there, use this, knock everything back down. After it dries and is out of there, you could reintroduce your uh, predaceous mites and work very nicely. And of course, there's the good old insecticidal soaps, uh, several brand names out there, MP, Concern, uh, Desex. All those uh, are labeled on herbs and can be used to knock spider mites down. And then if you need to reintroduce them to your biologicals, you can come in a short uh, time afterwards. Works out quite nicely. So that's it for the mites. So let's move on and look at some other things. One of the very popular herbs uh, for greenhouses to grow is sweet bay. And much of the sweet bay uh, that people obtain is usually coming off the west coast. It tends to come from California. Uh, you can either get rooted or unrooted and bring it on out. One of the problems is out in California, there's a thing called a bay uh, psyllid, or um, you can see the Latin name up here, a very small insect that sucks on that foliage. And you'll see it on the outdoor plants and in the greenhouses in California. Unfortunately, sometimes they, when you buy your plants, uh, you'll bring that into the greenhouse. What I would suggest when, bring, when you're uh, dealing with sweet bay is to isolate that before you stick it in uh, with your other plants when you're bringing in new shipments to make sure it's perfectly clean because you really don't want to introduce this one. Um, it's called the bay psyllid sucker and it's one of the names for it. Uh, very small little creature. Uh, it produces a little bit of white wax and uh, we've had growers mistake that for mealybug. And Nancy was just talking about mealybug, showing you all the different ones with the, the waxes excreted off that. But if you look at that cl insect closely, it really doesn't have the same shape as a, a, a mealybug by any means. Okay. Um, best control is don't bring it into the greenhouse. Um, I don't, for this one, don't really have a good biological control to tell you other than the physical thing of monitoring and making sure it doesn't come into a house. Once it came in, we have had growers use Azadirac and the Azotin, Nemazod, uh, Azadirac, and gotten fairly good suppression of this thing once it's in that uh, greenhouse. Also on Sweet Bay, there is a thing called the uh, Bay Roller Caterpillar, and they're in a the family called Tortricidae's leaf rollers. That's very common uh, in places like California and these production uh, greenhouses. And so when you bring in your cutting, you may have a, a population on those. You need to examine them closely, look for the little caterpillars. They'll take the leaves on the sweet bay and then roll it up, and they web that together. They put silk out of their mouth, and then they will come out of that and feed on the foliage and uh, destroy your, your sweet bay. Uh, on the controls on those, um, you know, we don't have many biologicals on this, but the in the greenhouse situation, but low risk materials would be spinosad, uh, spinosad conserver and trust are both labeled uh, and then we have material that's been around for a lot of years that's bacillus thuringianus which is a, a biopesticide that you could use to uh, control this caterpillar you get it in the early stages uh, some of the several names dipel caterpillar attack and several other names out there in the market uh, 
what you when you put it on something like uh, Sweet Bay, you do need some sort of spreader sticker to really get that BT to it, adhere to the foliage, and uh, that should give you a fairly effective control on, on bringing that thing uh, down. Now, <clears throat> both the speakers talked about thrips earlier this morning. Uh, that is a generalist uh, group, the thrips, and there are several different species that Suzanne mentioned this morning. Usually uh, in uh, greenhouses, one we find that dominates, at least in our state, is the western flower thrips on herbs. Uh, but there are a couple other species we've picked up in there. What you need to do is look at the prone plants to the thrips from, and that would include tarragon, lavender, rosemary, and of course basil. And basil is one of the most popular herbs that's grown in the greenhouse. Uh, our Maryland greenhouses say they just can't grow enough of that. So if you're growing these plants, you're going to need to monitor from early in the season. Now, we've got some really good biological control uh, that's available for those. If you're starting herbs, some are start from seeds. Many of your herbs are actually grown from, from cuttings. We'll look at that in a few minutes. But if you're starting from seed and you have plug trays that you're starting those out in, after the plants are up, have their true leaves going, what I would suggest is getting a hold of the predaceous mite, Amblyseus cucumeris. And these little uh, predaceous mites, you usually put about 200 per flat of plugs. You would sprinkle them out across the soil. And what you're doing is establishing the mite population on those plants. So when they get transplanted into your larger pot and moved on to the greenhouse, the mite goes with it. These mites are very effective on controlling the early instars of thrips, the first instar. Once you get into the second instar on the thrips, they tend to be a little more aggressive. Uh, they tend, if a mite comes over and tries to feed on them, they often use their tail to beat them back and they'll fight. So um, you want to get them established early so they catch those first instar thrips. And then, so that's what's going to work. They're not going to really work on adult thrips. Now, as far as the adult thrips go and the other life stages, what I would suggest is using banker plants. And I know we're going to have speakers later in the day this afternoon talking about a little more banker plants. We'll talk about it here on herbs. What I would suggest using is aureus insidiosus. Okay, it's called the minute uh, pirate bug. Now, during the winter months, with the shorter uh, uh, days, long nights, uh, this thing often goes into what we call diapause. They just aren't that active. But as we get into March and our day lengths begin to lengthen out, then they become very active. And they're active basically through the summer months and into the fall. What I would do, we're in January still. We're at the tail end of it. But this is a good time to be starting your banker plants. And what I would suggest using is pepper plants, specifically ones called Purple Flash. The reason you're using Purple Flash is it's a heavy flowering pepper plant. It produces a, a large amount of, of uh, pollen, um, but it's relatively slow growing, and that's why you want to start it early. Up in Canada, uh, they usually start their pepper plants in late November, December. We're a little bit further south here in Maryland. We can get by with starting in January. If you're further north, you'd want to start a little bit earlier. I started uh, my pepper plants uh, actually after the first of the year. That I have them under grow lights at this point, getting established. Uh, it's taken about three weeks, and they're up into the true leaf stage right now. That, but you want to size them up so as you get into the end of February, early March, then you can order your aureus insidiosus and release those on the pepper plants. With the pollen that's present, what will happen is the adult uh, aureus that you obtain will uh, spread themselves across that plant. They begin to feed on the pollen and then the female will insert her eggs into the leaves of that pepper plant. Will hatch out will be the uh, immature stages and nymphs of these uh, new pirate bugs. So you're trying to build up a population on these pepper plants, then you can move those out into your greenhouse where your herbs are and let them fan out from there. Once you've got this going, you can keep this pepper um, producing flowers through the spring and summer. If it begins to slow down a little bit, I've cut them back in the past and get them to flush more growth out of there and keep them in flower. You really don't want the uh, little pepper itself forming on there. You can go in and take those out to encourage it to continuing uh, continued flowering. So that's using the banker plant, and that's the easiest way to do with this aureus insidiosus. This will feed on the adult stages and 
the first and second instars of thrips and do a nice job for you in keeping those clean. Now, I mentioned a lot of the herbs are grown from cuttings. When you put them under a mist system, what I would suggest is that you use the animal pathogenic uh, fungi called Bouveria bassiana. And the commercial uh, product that's out in the market is under the name Botany Guard or Botany Guard, whichever way you prefer to say that. That usually involves about three sprays. The way this works is when you're under a mist system, you have high moisture there, during, especially during the day. Uh, when you make those applications, you want to find mist spray, and you're putting canidia out on that foliage. You want to make contact if any thrips are present. The little canidia, when they get on the body of that thrips, they grow in it, much like a seed germinating, put a little radical out. And when they grow inside, they'll produce hypo bodies, and that will kill the thrips. Very effective material. It's a good one to use. Uh, the other thing you can use is the entomopathogenic nematodes that Susan was talking about uh, earlier. Uh, I would use Steiner Nemo Feltier, and you can do that as a foliar spray. The nematodes do very well under high moisture situations. So when you're under a mist system, it's just ideal to be doing this. Okay. And finally, if you really want to go after them, I would use the um, Cucumeris. Now, you notice it has an N in front of that because the name switches between Neosilus and Amblyseus uh, Cucumeris. Uh, but it's still the same predaceous mite. And you release those usually about three times at about a week interval for each of these treatments that you're doing. Now, when you're finishing the herb crop, after you've got it rooted and growing out into that area, ones that are susceptible, I would suggest using the, oops, Amblyse uh oh, we just lost the screen. Yep. Let me back it up here, sorry. We lost the screen for a second, I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, the, uh, I would use Amblyseus cucumeris in mini sachets. You can purchase these, they look like little tea bags. Many of them have it set up now where they have a little uh, hole that they can exit out. And you would hang those up on the plants. And it has a breeding sachet. They'll have little, um, uh, the predaceous mite inside there and have grain mite inside that they're feeding on. And they can move out of that bag and establish themselves on your plants. Okay. Now, I'd also suggest using the Steinernema feltiae that we talked about earlier, the nematodes and apply that as a foliar spray to get any of the nymphs of the thrips. Very, very effective control measure to use for thrips control. On aphid uh, prone herb plants, uh, what I would look at is lemon verbena. That's highly attractive to aphids. Oregano seems to be a magnet for them. Basil, favorite plant here. And sage, of course. All the sages seem to be highly attractive to uh, this group of insects. If we were looking at, oops, it didn't come across. Well, let's imagine we're looking at an aphid there. Uh, on the aphids, the way you distinguish those, and, and Nancy did an excellent job earlier showing you, you want to look at the, the rear end for the presence of the cornicles, little structures sticking out of the back end of those. Uh, they have a long sucking-like mouth part. They insert into the plant, and they feed it within the phloem of it. The thing you have to keep in mind is, when they're in the greenhouse, they tend to go into asexual reproduction where there's no males present, so it's females cranking out additional young, and they're all females. So they can go from a small little area where you have an infection, an epicenter, and suddenly you have a raging bonfire of aphids because they can crank these out so quickly. When the population reaches high levels, you often see winged aphids being produced, and those will spread themselves out across the greenhouse. Some other things uh, Nancy was mentioning about uh, the characteristics of for aphids, they tend to shed their skin because they grow so quickly. You'll see little cast skins laying around on the foliage. You get stunning of growth. If you see honeydew on the foliage and sooty mold, sooty mold because it's high humidity in there growing on that honeydew, uh, those are all things you want to look for. Keep in mind that some of those aphids are actually uh, <laughs> virus transmitters. <laughs> okay, good. This is great. Well, so we see words up here, but we don't see actual pictures of the aphids, and I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, but some of the common ones we see are green peach aphid, foxglove aphid, uh, potato aphid, chrysanthemum aphid, and melon aphid. So we won't go on those. <laughs> the green peach aphid, which is one of the most common ones to be found on the herbs, tends to be found on tip growth. So that's where you want to monitor and 
They're in the PDF though, so okay. All right, I see a note here. All right, someone just going to said you can see them. Uh, green peach aphids tend to be on tip growth. Uh, they really explode as they get into March through early June. They can really take off, so you need to monitor closely on these prone plants before they have a chance to uh, get running on you. Uh, green, there's a green pea shaved. I assume you're looking at a picture of it. I'm just seeing words over here. Uh, you'll see the long cornicles. They're slightly flared at the tip, a little bit of blackening on the ends of those uh, cord, uh, cornicles. And right in between the head capsule, it looks like if someone uh, hit it with a 2 by 4 Push it in there. The melon aphids, uh, there's different forms of these. We have a dark color one, it's kind of a dark green. You also have some that are mottled color. Uh, so they do vary a little bit, but they all have dome-shaped head capsules. The cornicles are black for the full length. Okay, uh, those are just different forms there. Now, as far as the uh, control goes for biological, what I would suggest is using the Phidias colmeni. Uh, that does a very, very good job on the green peach aphid and the melon aphids. Uh, it's a little wasp. You can release that into the greenhouse, and uh, they go up to the uh, immature stages of the uh, aphid, and the female will put her ovipause in there, lay egg, and that larvae develops inside and does a good job of killing it. Uh, if you have other species of uh, aphids in there, like the potato aphid, that uh, is active on your herbs, then I would suggest using Aphidias herbi. You can, when you go to your biological supplier, ask them to give you a mix of colmeni and herbi together, so that way you, you know, get all the species there. All right. Okay, I'm looking at a blank thing here. Let's see. All right, so biological control. <laughs> I'm going to skip the next one there. Yeah, I can't look at those texts right now. Uh, if you're thinking of trying biological control, what I would suggest uh, looking at barley, rye, or oats. What you do is you uh, get those from a farm supply store. You put them in a small pot and seed them, allow them to come up. What you then will do is contact um, a biological supplier and you want to get a hold of a uh, aphid called the bird cherry oat aphid. That's specific just to monocots, so just feed on those grasses that you're growing basically. And you want to establish an aphid population. Now it sounds counterintuitive that you'd want to put aphids in your greenhouse, but these are aphids that are just going to be hitting your uh, uh, barleys and that sort of thing. So <clears throat> um, there is a fact sheet I have available. If you go to this website listed there, it'll tell you how to use these a little more. All right, and let's see, we're going to skip over here. Um, well, usually you're going to use the uh, aphid parasitoid uh, released at about 50 aphidias uh, per six inch pot. Okay. Uh, one thing when you're using these uh, plants out in the uh, banker plants and they have the aphids on them, uh, after you have that established, you release the predaceous mites, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, that's right, the aphidias on the uh, banker plants and then put them out in that greenhouse. You'll find aphids will often come up on your benches and they'll go after the honeydew that the aphids are producing and they'll actually protect the um, aphids. So what uh, this girl or Denise would do is she'd put a Vaseline layer around the edge of that pot to prevent that from getting up on there. Okay. There's uh, the bird cherry oat aphid that you can supply and uh, obtain from the biological supply house. All right, I think we're at uh, 12.20 and it's time to answer questions. Uh, so, Brian, we can take any questions. Okay, so um, there's a question that, uh, that um, I, I think it was for Suzanne, but, but maybe uh, um, Stanton, you can um, answer. Where do aphids overwinter? Um, it depends on the aphid species, of course. But if you're talking about green peach aphid, uh, outdoors, uh, you find them quite often on some of the weed species, like curly dock is one of the things that they will overwinter uh, on. And then they get active in the springtime and they'll fly over to crops in an orchard, they'd be active in the fruit trees. In greenhouses, they are pretty much can be active year round. They really don't have to go through any uh, diapause period or anything, or resting. Um, some of the aphid species uh, that are uh, living outdoors. Excuse me. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, the way it works is, is it gets into the fall when the days shorten up, they'll start to produce winged male and female, and those will mate. 
and then the female will actually lay an egg rather than lie birth out like they normally do in a greenhouse. And so the eggs on outdoor situations, they would lay the eggs on the bark of a tree or in a plant or a weed or whatever because overwintering form does much better in that egg stage. But in a greenhouse, they don't have to do that. They'll just reproduce um, parthenogenically where the female just bursts out the uh, uh, young uh, nymphs. Okay. Um, what about, uh, the question was asked about, um, would using humidity trays under problem herbs help with reducing pest issues? And would the humidity trays improve pest control with biocontrols? The thing you have to be careful with humidity trays, I think, on that is if you increase humidity too much, you may end kick yourself into some of the disease problems with botrytis and that sort of thing. So that would be a, a interesting line to try and walk <laughs> and maintain in there. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I wouldn't try and do attempt that. Okay. Uh, could you elaborate on why you'd use pepper plants as banker plants? Are the aureus attracted to these over other plants? Well, there's been other plants that have been used. Um, it, the aureus um, do like the pollen sources, and they did work years ago. It was done down at uh, Ron Odding down in Georgia. It was looking at actually apple pollen and different fruit pollens that they would obtain from different suppliers, and they would sprinkle it out on plants, and the uh, aureus will feed on that. Um, the only thing is that's very expensive to obtain. So it wasn't really feasible. Uh, they also looked at using castor oil bean plants. Now, if you know a castor oil bean plant, it, if you grow it outside, it's huge. It gets six, seven feet high. So Ron was looking and having graduate students look at dwarf varieties of castor oil bean pots in pots. And he found that aureus feeds very, very nicely on the pollen on that and did a good job. Trouble is, again, even the most dwarf one really didn't, it got too big. The, the peppers, they've tried several different varieties of those um, uh, over the years, and uh, they've narrowed it down in the last three or four years to this purple flash. Not to say that's the only one out there, but that's the one that consistently seems to flower heavily, produce a lot of pollen, which encourages them to lay more eggs in the foliage. All right. Um, so you suggest using cucumeris early in the first instar stage. Um, would you not have many stages of thrips in the greenhouse at one time? Well, if you let it go, yes, absolutely. <laughs> the idea with any of these biological controls is you have to get early in in the game. It, when you're back at the uh, plug tray stage when we're putting them on there, quite often you're going to have very low thrips population or none present at all. It, it's really kind of a precautionary thing. You're trying to keep them building up. You have to think differently on biological control than you do chemical. Chemical, you let something run and you can hit it, but in this case, you'd have to start early on. Yeah. Okay. Um, a question about where to get the oat aphid, and which yeah. grain is the easiest or best for rearing it in in a cool greenhouse? Yeah. Um, the for several years now, we've been using barley. And we just go to a farm supply store and get a hold of that. And I should point out, when we're doing that, we put it in the pots, and we put it in, a, after we're growing it, we put it in a caged area. And uh, in that caged area, we release the um, bird cherry oat aphid, which you can get from most of the biological supply houses. Um, Susan was earlier talking about places like uh, BioBest and um, some of the other ones. Uh, most of those places will carry these aphids. But once you buy them, what we'll do is put them in with the pots in that screened area. And uh, the reason the screening is on there is once um, we have the aphids established, we'll pull out plants we want to infect with the uh, uh, aphidias. And we'll let the aphidias establish on those, but we don't want them to get on our plants that are in that screen area because we want to continually keep an aphid population alive. They'll, they'll wipe them out on you, and you'd have to buy more from the biological supply house. The idea is to start them early in the season, keep your own aphid colony going, keep your cost down. Okay. Um, for, for those uh, um, cages, does it need to be cages made from thrip screen, or can it be a, a, a less dense screen? Now, I'd, I'd use something that, uh, it doesn't have to be as fine as thrift screen. 
um, but it has to be something fairly small. On some of the biological supply houses now, they'll actually you can buy the cage from them. They're already they're making them out of wood, and they stretch a screen over there, and they've got little doors on them that you open up, and has a latch to it, closes up real nice. Um, you know, but that costs a fair amount of money. If, if you're handy and can build things, it's basically a wood frame and uh, fine mesh screening uh, that would keep out the wasp. And the wasp got a fair size to it, so it doesn't have to be extremely fine mesh. Uh, it's almost like a, um, I'm trying to think what it would be. Uh, I'm trying to think of a, a density to tell you on that. But anyhow, there's some right. meshings on there. But any sort of door you'd have, uh, we've had some of our growers take Velcro and put it along there. So when they close it up, it makes a nice tight seal that the wasp can't get in around. Okay, what about any low-risk chemicals that you could recommend to take care of aphids on herb plants? Well, the materials that we're talking about on the uh, some of the other things, like the azadiractin, the, um, um, the neem products would work. Um, we have used oil on them. Insecticidal soaps, to a certain degree, can help suppress um, thrips population. And the oil and the soap, after it dries, it's not going to have any impact on any of your beneficials you're using in there. But you don't use them in emergencies. If you're doing biological control, if things weren't working on the biological control, to bring it back under uh, control and then go back in again. So you want real short residual materials like that. All right. Well, there's a few more questions, but I'm, I'm, we're we've out of time here. So um, you know, if you have questions that didn't get answered. Um, <clears throat> Stan's email is uh, on his slide set. Uh, you can um, email him directly. Um, Stan, thank you for, for taking your time today. We appreciate it.